Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Shared Discovery, the show and podcast dedicated to sharing all the exciting and enjoyable aspects of games and gaming. I'm your host, uh, Victor, and today I'm once again joined by Ron. Ron, how you doing? I can't say how you've been doing since last week, because this is a follow-up episode, uh, but how you doing since... You know, I'm doing well, doing well. Uh, hanging in there. How about yourself? I'm doing great. I'm super excited. You know, as, as I do sometimes, I overestimate our ability to condense things into an hour. So this is actually our f part two episode of why we think it's worth playing Magic the Gathering, uh, which is great. This gives us more time to do what we always want to do, talk about magic. Uh, yes. Yes, it's a must. It's a must. I can't live without talking about magic. I literally, I was typing up the notes, and I'm like, all right, that's page nine. Okay, that's fine. That's page There's 10. Oh, that's pages. fine. That's page 11. Okay, maybe we gotta split this up. So we did it, we're here. So welcome back. We're gonna go over, do a little brief recap to last episode, just to, because we're gonna be referencing that a lot this episode. So we're gonna do a recap and that's where we're gonna start and then we're gonna move into some of the some of the topics that that we missed last time. All right, sounds good. Where would you like to start? So just a brief recap, Magic the Gathering is a tabletop collectible card game uh, created in 1993 by Richard Garfield. Uh, players will play with constructed decks of cards that they collect from trading or buying packs, booster packs, and you play as a planeswalker. And you're trying to defeat each other with spells by getting your opponent's life total down to zero. And that's the goal, is to win the game. And there are some other ways to win the game, but that's the predominant way, is doing enough damage to knock the other player out of the game. All right. And the first spot that we started after that history was the color pie, uh, which is something that Richard Garfield decided to put into the game as like ideological representations of yes. what the colors are doing, what they're hoping to achieve, why they're battling. I'm a big fan of ideology. Absolutely. It's one of my favorite parts of Magic Absolutely. is the color wheel and like, doing things in colors that it's not supposed to be doing or it maybe doesn't do normally. Exactly, so of. every color has things that it's good at, things that it's not really good at, and there is a philosophy, a real world philosophy behind that. So of the five colors, you have white, blue, black, red, and green in that order. So we're just gonna go through right now, super brief recap of each color and then We'll keep moving. So lightning round. Boom, boom, boom. Let's so go. White, white is the color of peace, law, structure, selflessness, and equality. It's focused on social organization, equality, and peace above all. So peace on earth. Yeah. So that's yep. white peace. That's its fundamental belief. Mm. How about blue? Blue is all about knowledge, getting big brain status, mm -hmm. deceit, caution deliberation, taking your time, not making any rash movements, and perfection. You want to perfect your art, you want to perfect your play, you want to uh, be unstoppable in uh, every way because you know it every, uh, know every aspect, you know everything, you know what they're gonna do next. I know what I'm, I'm gonna stop you, I'm gonna take your things because I know everything. And time, <laughs> if you will. And next up is? Black. Black is the color of power, self-interest, death, sacrifice, and uninhibitedness. Ooh, uninhibitedness. So this is the color that says the only measure of right and wrong is whether or not the approach leads to success. So whatever success is for them, right? Well, and so they're gonna use any means necessary, anything, even if it's viewed as taboo, uh, it's gonna use any means necessary and it sees the value in selfishness. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna be a cheater, but you know. Betrayal, if betrayal helps you, right? And mm -hmm. so the core philosophy for black is self-determination and just release from society's imposed limits. Cut that link. I'm not worrying about anybody but myself. Some of their virtues are self-love, self-reliance, willingness to face the ug ugly side of things yeah. head on. There's ugly side things in life. Let's, let's tackle them. Like necromancy. Necromancy. Pretty gross. It's pretty gross, but if it helps you succeed, Black Mage is gonna take advantage of it. How about red? Red is 
fire, it is passion, it is freedom, passion. motion, impulse, and destruction. Mm -hmm. You wanna, you wanna just break and shatter things that other people care about, but you want to hold the things that you love most close and dear to your heart. And you want to be free to do those things as much and as often as you can, you know? It's very similar to black in that it doesn't really want to hold back, but it's not as amoral. Yeah. It has things it cares about. Absolutely. Right? It's just, yeah. Things it cares about beyond itself. That's right. the difference there. Exactly, mm -hmm. but it wants to burn down those structures that maybe white is trying to that build. It inhibits them. Inhibits them, mm -hmm. holds them back. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, we have green. Green is the color of nature, wildlife, connection, spirituality, and tradition. So green loves the world the way it is, right? Green, nature already got it right. Yes. And so it just needs time to be allowed to develop its further perfection. Why change it? It's great it's the way perfect. it is. Yeah. Become more Classic perfect. Classic Coke right here. <laughs> so it wants to ex coexist with the ecosystem, with nature, and it views, uh, prefers like simplistic ways of living, right? Mm. And it believes that individuals are born with a purpose imprinted into their genes. I like that. Right? That sounds nice. So it, it Green views that believes that every individual is part of the greater picture. The na nature, tapestry of life, the universe, destiny. Every person has that purpose, but sometimes we just get caught up too in the individual to see what that purpose is. Hmm. So traditional, but like nature traditional, like hippie, druid, kind of good stuff going it's, on there. Absolutely. Yeah. And so those are the five colors. That's a that's a speed run. Spe teaser to next week's episode. Speed run of oh. talking about the oh. the colors, right? And yeah. there's a lot of connections. There's enemy colors, there's there's ally colors and these colors will overlap and create new identities. We could keep going on about this, but we think if you're someone who really likes philosophy, there is a way to dive in to the color into the game from this perspective and say, I like the way that this plays. I like the characters that use these. So oh, this yeah. is this is great. I get a lot of joy from studying and understanding the philosophy of the game. Oh yeah. And so from there, we talk, talked a little bit about archetypes, right? Some people might not care about as much about philosophy. They want to know how the game is played. So that from there, there's these four archetypes, right? There's aggro. I want to kill the opponent as quickly as possible. Get it done. There's mid-range, where it's going to take a little time to get off the ground, but they have, after a while, they have these hard-to-kill threats that have haymakers. So I need to figure out Boom. what is Boom. going on, what everyone else is doing, what I'm doing, and then I will just use the answers that I have to suss out the situation and finish it up mid-range. Yep, takes a little time. And then after mm -hmm. that is control, which is even slower. At first, they don't care about winning at first. Mm, sit take back, my time. take it easy. Get, get rid What's of here. Rush? Counter spell. Destroy that. that. Get that out of your hand. I don't Discard need to be casting card. spells. I can just hold all my mana up and do mm -hmm. absolutely nothing but draw a card every turn. <laughs> What are you doing to me? Nothing. The long-term plan. The long right? game, mm -hmm. right? The so long con. Yeah, so they're going to whittle you of resources until they can take over and hit you with a big threat. Got it. Maybe like a big dragon or a big creature. Just well, like Usually these decks will only have a few of them because right. they don't need a lot. Mm -hmm. Some monster time forgotten mm -hmm. you've got hidden away yep. somewhere in a crystal or something. And then the last one is combo. So combo is, co is light control. Oh where you're um, slowly stopping your opponents, but you have these specific sequence of cards mm -hmm. that will insta-win the boom, insta-win button. Boom, yep. boom, boom. Going infinite is what this is called, mm -hmm. where it'll c create this loop of like shooting your opponent, pew, 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 yep. until they're dead in some way. Just like combos in a fighting game, you gotta get those exact inputs, and you wanna hold everybody off till you get them, and then boom, it's over. 
And I think fighting games is actually a really good comparison here because fighting games has a lot of uh, has similarities in a lot of these archetypes. Style. It yep. has aggro like out of the gate. I'm jumping at you and punch, punch, punch. Yep. Mid range, I'm s stepping back a little bit, mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna go in with these combos, um, not these com like these huge threats, which in those games are called combos. Right. Right. And there's uh, <laughs> control where you can throw jab, down like jab, uh, jab, uh, yeah jab, jab, little jab. little hits <laughs> with a lot of uh, maybe. <laughs> Uh, gr like throwing down some grease, maybe people slip around, like jumping, flying around, a lot of mobility, a lot of utility, mm -hmm. where it's not necessarily doing damage, but it's just frustrating your opponent. You're gonna see tilt them. the life total go slowly down over the game. Oh yeah, and if you're in control, your life total isn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's gonna stay right here. You're jabbing and you're dodging. Yes. And then a combo might not be as direct a comparison. Maybe that's like, what comes to mind is like forcing a player again into like a wall position where they, a lot of games don't have this anymore, but older games would have like spots where you could just in infinitely break them. Cheese them. They can't move. Mm -hmm. So if a lot of the gameplay would revolve around like avoiding that spot, mm -hmm. or getting, pushing that player into ring that spot. Ring outs and things like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah, ring outs, that's a very good one. Very good. Comp so. so all I have to do is land a kick in a specific way and you're gone. I don't have That's to. a combo. It's an instant win button. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't have to yeah. lower your health. Good comparison. Yeah. I like that a lot. And so these are for the players that are like gameplay minded. Of, mm -hmm. All right, all right. What? Where do I sit? How do I want to play? And it really supports a lot of different play styles. Yes. Because I have some aggro decks where I go fast and I also have some control decks where I like sit back, I'm gonna watch, I'm gonna draw a bunch of cards. And so that helps for me with diversity of play too. So mm -hmm. That's archetypes. And then the last thing we touched on before last, uh, at the end of last episode were the player psychographics, which the player psychographics Wizards of the Coast created as an abstract way to understand why you play the game, how, why and how. I'm still surprised that it was Wizards of the Coast that actually mm -hmm. put this together because it feels so like naturalistic, so much like a thing that players would make yeah. on their own. But yeah, it's just yeah. uh, Timmy likes the big exciting plays, mm -hmm. likes to show off, likes to be social and talk about what's going on in the game and just, you know, love the game for the game. and. Uh, then you got the Johnny, or uh, this is your builder, your your complex designer, your um, your combo players, your, your off hipster, your hipster magic hipsters are a thing. Oh yeah, These I'm gonna take magic. this weird card. <laughs> I'm gonna play. Nobody plays it for a reason, but I'm gonna find a reason to play it. Oh yeah, and I'm going to take it and make it valuable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then we have Spike, which is. This guy right here. I like winning. Yeah, that's it. I like winning. All right. <laughs> I want to show you how good I am at the game. <laughs> and I think. I like winning. That's our wrap up of and, everything we touched on the last And though. what I really liked about oh, yeah. the wiki page is they had a sentence at the end of each of these descriptions about mm. how they view winning, right? So for the Timmy slash Tammies, it's like they don't really care if they win or lose as long as they were having fun playing their big fact effects, as long as yes. they got to play their 2020, as long yes. as they got to play the spell that cost 10 mana, right? Oh yeah, I'm a little bit there. I just, you know, mm -hmm. just let me do a thing. Mm -hmm. Just make me, let me make some tokens, let me uh, hit some stuff, oh, and yeah. I'm a happy boy. I'm happy, you're a happy Ron. Mm -hmm. And then Johnny's, the sentence they had is like, they're happiest when their decks work. So for them, one win out of many games, yeah, I won, I won one, lost nine, that's fine, as long as I won with my weird card that you said was bad. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine, if I win on my terms. Yeah, what's the uh, win-loss ratio? I have no idea what that means. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, then, and then spikes, and it said, if a spike plays several games, loses one, but feels they should have won that one, I, I had that, then they're, they're gonna be upset, they're gonna be malcontent. So yeah. I like I really like the psychographics because it can really get you into like why actually am I having fun playing the game? Why? What kind of decks am I making? <laughs> and that can focus you into certain colors, certain archetypes, and that can guide your play to maximize the fun that you're having. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's 
an update to where we are now in aesthetic profiles. Yeah, aesthetic profiles. And you want to take this? Yeah, I'll take this. And aesthetic profiles were added in addition to psychographics to say, to kind of understand, well, how do players find beauty in the game? Mm. Right? So in addition to the psychographics of why, it's like, what do I find beauty? So the first type here is called the Mel, or the mechanic player. Uh. And they're characterized by appreciating the cards for the delicate and interesting interactions, as well as the strong me mechanics. So they really like the cards that, that come together perfectly. From the, the name, the art, the mechanics, the power and toughness, they are like super interested in like the structures that made this card exist and function well. So they like, okay, this card has the right color, the rules, oh, they made this perfect templating so that I could have this new card type. I never thought that would fit on a card. I, or like every now and then Magic will update its rules. Okay. And they'll, every now and then you'll hear like, we don't know how to do that. We don't have the technology to put, the terminology to put that in a card. And then years later, like, we found the words we need for it. All right. We found the words to do the mechanic we've been wanting to do. Yeah, it's always in development. It's always in development. And Mel's l love that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so opposed to Mel, or in addition to Mel, like, again, these are alongside. Aren't, alongside, these aren't prescriptive. They're descriptive, and you can embody all characteristics of the, right. a little of each, is the Vorthos player, or the flavor player. Ooh. Someone who's focused on the creative side of the game. Oh yeah. A Vorthos player is characterized by appreciating the cards for the flavor and the creative consistency. Yes. Right, so the name, the illustration, the card concept, the subtype, the flavor text, each of these help paint the picture of the card. Does this card make sense in lore, right? It does the color identity make sense for that character? Or a lot of the Vorthos players would be like, why is this character now this color identity? Right? What happened in the story to move this blue character to a white character or a blue white right. character? And then they build a whole deck around the theme of this character transitioning into another color and their whole adventure and experience, right? Like, Absolutely. Yes. And for me, I, def I absolutely land on the Vorthos side mm -hmm. of the game. I am super interested in the flavor. I will oftentimes, there's the database to look at cards is called Scryfall, and so I'll often go on there, pick a card, and just look at all of the versions of that have been printed at, wow. and just see like how the printing process, maybe this is the Mel as I'm talking, but as the oh. art saturations will change mm. throughout it. Maybe that's the Mel as I'm thinking about it. Right. That's like a process, a printing process. Yeah, it's really like nitty gritty. Yeah. Like materialist. Yeah, and but so I am thinking that might be Mel, but I, on the Vorthos side, the flavor okay. side, I really, I have like the squirrels here. <laughs> this picture, of, this is what squirrels look like across the multiverse, and I love this because it'll tell, it has like specific different versions of the squirrels. Like this one looks like a watermelon. This one has horns in this plane. These ones are gray. And so they're different styles of squirrels. And this one has like glowing eyes on that plane. For, and like the squirrels of this plane fused with magic. What does this say about acorn generating device powered by the hopes and dreams of every squirrel in the multiverse? <laughs> That makes me want to look into this. It's uh, this is a card called Chitter Spitter. It spits out acorn. <laughs> that's super flavorful. It, I mean, the best card, but like that's got me interested. Like, what is that? It, the hopes and dreams of squirrels are the squirrels like sentient in this verse. It, it makes me think. I think it makes me think. Another aspect of that is a goblin. Goblin is a really popular creature type in Magic and they exist across many planes. And what I've done is I just like go and get what are called tokens that you, some cards will create these mm. and they'll, you'll get these creatures. And goblins, you look at them, you can tell it's a goblin, but they look different across all of the planes, right? They have 
different nose structures, different colors, different fur, <laughs> right? different head shapes. Different head shapes. It's and so I find it really fascinating how across this multiverse, across these dimensions, goblins are the same but different, right? Like, is there a being that created all of these goblins? Yeah, right? it's it's something to obsess over. That's for sure. Oh, I have. You see all these? Yeah. <laughs> Went out of my way to try to get all of the goblin Every tokens. Every single that one. That exist, right? Because I find it, I just find it fascinating how the colors will be different, the textures, the sizes, but at the core, they're always red, which means they're always focused on freedom, right? At its core, and they're always in tribes. There's these sim similar personalities yeah, and characters. Always aggressive. Always aggressive. <laughs> and silly and so silly they're always so silly yes as that's that does it for me too <laughs> it's the silliness of them We've got a goblin pirate they, they have a whole culture and lore they even have mm -hmm. a messianic figure mm -hmm. that you can uh, read about and look up there's um, a metallic one like well, that one got possessed it is so it's really fascinating to me on the fourth that was side have sausages in his mouth <laughs> petals he's got roses roses yeah okay. and, it's, Red and roses. i love the art i love the story and it's so fun for me to dive into these these goblins specifically and say okay what is the deal with them <laughs> right and that's a fourth those player so you're uh, big into the lore, you read mm. the books. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, I've started reading the books recently, which um, starting back with, with Urza, so I th found it really fascinating to see, start, see the books and see them represented in the card, and then yeah. be like, does that actually, does that color make sense with what he did in the book? Whoa. Right? That's some questions right there. <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, so that's a Vorthos player. Mm -hmm. Thanks for... Thanks for letting me show off my goblins, guys. <laughs> I, every time we, I, play, I have a goblin deck, every time I play, I try to play, use a diff some different goblin tokens so you can see the multiverse of goblins I've got. Oh yeah, <laughs> every time, it's a good time. And so this aesthetic profile is like, I find beauty in the flavor. Mm -hmm. I, I also have found beauty in the process of the card getting created. Mm -hmm. like, why does a card from 1998 that's been reprinted 10 times, why is the saturation changing so much? And how does the color of that art change the meaning of what the art is? So that's the aesthetic profile, right? And what will happen is you, these will overlap with the psychographics, mm -hmm. right? So you'll be like, I'm a spike, but I'll be like, I'm a Vorthos spike. Oh. I want things that are strong and win, but also flavorful. Mix and match. Hence goblins. Yeah. Goblins are strong, but also really flavorful. And uh, I'm a big fan of uh, tribes. Goblins are mm -hmm. a type of tribe. It's mm -hmm. just a type of creature. Like humans are a tribe. Any any uh, real character or creature type mm -hmm. is a tribe. And yes. I love tribes and uh, just learning about them and stuff like that and how many different kinds there are. So in that way, I'm a Vorthos, but sure. I'm also kind of interested in the mechanics sure. more of an overarching way mm -hmm. i don't usually dig down into the nitty-gritty of the mechanics unless i have to sure. but that's just me that's just yeah you were so blue last episode what happened oh the red's coming out the red's yeah. coming out ron come <laughs> on okay so you're blue red is what you're saying oh for sure okay yeah i am through and through blue red i like my freedom but i like my crazy experiments and stuff. Too. You want to know a lot of ways, know a lot of things, so you know how you can best express your freedom. You got it. Okay, yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. Me too. I think that's a good question. We didn't ask her, so yeah. our color. I think I'm probably, I'm probably blue, right? Mm -hmm. I like to know a lot of things, right? Uh, hence the flavor, the reading, the mechanics. I've listened to 300 plus episodes of had designer of magic mark rosewater's podcast so, so much i know so much about the game and i just want to keep learning right yeah. so blue i'd say i probably am white as well white on the um community morality 
uh, good. So probably blue-white, I would say, uh, is, are the two dominant ones, which is funny because I like to play red a lot. Right, yeah, you like your gambling, you mm -hmm. like your uh, wild and crazy explosions and yeah. um, goblins, Gobl goblins everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. Which brings me, which makes me think another facet of this game is being able to express maybe a different identity than what you identify as. If, mm. So even though I'm more aligned with blue mm -hmm. or, and white, I think, um, and don't express the red side of life, right, as yeah. much like red freedom chaos i don't express that as a person as much so me so i th i'm thinking like the game allows me to do that yes for sure like that's a big part of why i play magic is that expression and being able to play in different mindsets than i normally mm. like live my life that's a right? good way to put it a different mindset yeah it's like role playing games yes. i want to play someone who's not me yep. right? i want to play someone that's more interesting or uh, maybe more of a coward or uh, maybe more stupid or what have you but you know I'm only as stupid as I can be right but in in my normal life it's a very know, green statement there oh, right uh, oh what color <laughs> am I no, no. oh <laughs> see this is this is why we love the color pie and these ideas it's because you can sit here and go back and forth of like where do I land what color am I uh, what, how do I like to express myself in the game? And they're not like siloed off columns. Mm -hmm. It's a gradient. It's it totally just like mix and match and mm -hmm. play with them and see what fits for you. Absolutely. So you can, so me, uh, I would say I'm a blue, mm. white mm? human. Oh. <laughs> That's my creature type. One, one. Can I get two, two? One two. <laughs> one two. Yeah, toughness. <laughs> okay. Maybe a little first strike in there. Uh, so. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. And that's that's funny because Vorthos players get a lot of uh, get really upset with the um, the flavor of power and toughness a lot. Yes, oh, I love this. Because you will have things like a a squirrel is a one one, but also so is a trained human soldier. <laughs> I love it so much. Or and it's just snake. That's just the mechanical requirements yeah. for the game. Yep. There's an Eldrazi god, so think of um, Cthulhu, mm -hmm. right? It's like a, it's not a god, but like a space monster. It's like a 15-15. 15 squirrels can defeat it. 15 squirrels can stack Stacked on top of each other. killer of worlds. Yes. So a Vorthos player is like, ah. That doesn't work. That's add absurd. up. That's, That's absurd. absurd. So that adds some absurdity to yeah. the game. There, it's like, oh man, that doesn't make sense, right? I'd never thought of that before, but yeah, fifteen squirrels can so kill a god. Can kill a god, <laughs> right? And that's. If you're making a game, you're just going to have to sacrifice some flavor yeah. sometimes, right? Just roll with it. So a Mel might say, well, that's just how it, that's how it has to be. Look how it came together to make the game function as well as it did. And Vorthos said, but like, squirrels can't kill a space monster, dude. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> I thought we discovered that the squirrels might be sentient, so that might add a little. Maybe they're trained <laughs> in care. martial skill, warfare. You know how to use a pike. And I don't uh, care how sentient a squirrel is. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a god killer. <laughs> not a god killer. Okay. Oh man. So let's should we get back on track and talk about how to actually play the game, how people use the cards to play. Sure, that's uh, formats, right? Yeah, that's formats. And formats are the various ways and rule sets of how players use the cards to play against each other. Okay. Right. So you, you're like, okay, I, I get it. I want to play. I want to play a red deck. You said aggro. I like playing fast. I get it. Well, how can I do that, right? Mm. And so each format provides its own rules for deck construction and gameplay, and there's often a pool, it's confined to a pool of cards, right? So Magic the Gathering has over 25,000 cards at this point. Like unique? Unique, mechanically unique cards. Wow. Mechanically, name, 25,000, right? It's a lot. It's a lot. So what these, a lot of formats will do is like, okay, here's all of it. 
let's shrink it down. You're gonna build decks in this from these requirements, mm -hmm. and we can build a, a meta to play in. And so what the formats are divided into two main categories by the Wizards Play Network, which is the sanctioning body for Wizards, the way that Wizards of the Coast uh, creates its formats, and it is tournament and casual. Okay. Formats, right? And so, and there's a term called sanctioned, right? So sanctioned refers to formats that the WPN, the Wizard Play Network, allows, is allowed to run at official events, right? So if Wizards is putting on an event, it has to be sanctioned to play, and there can be casual sanction. There's a few casual, and all of the tournament ones are sanctioned because they can be run at an event. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why would you have an unsanctioned tournament event? Well, you'll see when we get to the casual side, there are like some hobby shops like the formats enough to to host informal tournaments. Okay. But the tournament formats we're talking about are sanctioned by wizards to be uh, played at events. All right. So you say you're a spike, you want to win, you want to play. These these are the formats you might be looking for. These are the ones where you get trophies. These are the ones where it's like official, like they'll send you out to Vegas to play uh, other masters Prize of the craft. Pools, yeah. Expensive cards, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get to design your own if you win sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, that was really cool. They did a um, series of that from for about 10 years um, between like 2003, 2013, I believe, where mm. the winners of, I can't remember which tournament series, but the winners of those actually got to work with designers at Wizard to design their own card and an artist made art in their likeness. Ooh, that's so cool. So cool, and that's a huge, that's a sweet reward. And they, they actually just brought that back this year. Oh. They printed, they, there's a new card called a Fairy Mastermind. Yeah. And it actually says the name of the person who won the tournament in the flavor text and the tournament that they won it in. So that, that's incredible. That's a reward that you could look forward to if you were trying to trying to really compete. You could so try to get maybe not back. look forward to mm -hmm. try to achieve. So exactly. tournament formats are broken up into constructed. Yes. Which allows players to build decks from um, the entirety of legal pool of cards mm -hmm. um, in the specific format in advance to the tournament, mm. right? So you're gonna know which format you're signing up for, you're gonna know the legal pool of cards before the tournament, mm -hmm. so you can build your deck to those restrictions, practice it, and then come and play on that day. I feel like this is one of the most played formats. Absolutely, people like to bring in there. Right. Come with what they want to play with, right? And like, there's a lot of uh, really good conversation and really good community. I feel like to be had around constructive. Absolutely. Where everyone's sharing their cool deck ideas. Mm -hmm. Like, I know one from my memory is Red Deck Wins. Oh yeah, that is the very classic from the very beginning of the game, where you just play red spells, and go fast, <laughs> and, and try to win. win, and you try to win, and so that is a a style that has existed right across mm -hmm. the the game so and like you said constructed formats give you the prep time to communicate mm -hmm. to practice to do research and then limited formats on the other hand they require players to open a specific number of products at the event okay so and it could then, be a handful of boosters or it could be a whole box or something it could be. exactly a specific number which you will know that in advance and you will know what what sets you're getting oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have random <laughs> stuff that oh. like chaos drafts, what they're called, right? You get this pack from all of these different sets. I love it. Make a deck, right? Yeah. And so this puts your like knowledge to the test of like how my construction and my skills of like building a deck within mm -hmm. a time frame. You might get like an hour with the cards you got to build a deck and then you're gonna play a tournament that way. I'm personally no good at this, but it's one of my favorites. It's very skill intensive. Mm -hmm. so you're someone who like really is into the nuts and, not the nuts and bolts, like the nuts and bolts. Helps, is, but. Yeah, the nuts and bolts helps like being really really knowledgeable about the game and constructing on the fly. You like mm -hmm. that pressure. Limited formats are for are probably for you. So right. one of the most played constructed formats is called standard. 
and standard is played at local hobby shops, often on Friday nights. And these consist of typically the most um, recently released like standard sets. So they'll release pretty standard. Yeah, Magic will bring will release sets of cards in like three hundreds at a time, and then standard will say this many sets. This six sets are in rotation right now. Build a deck out of those, and let's compete. Build, yeah. build your 60-card deck, let's compete. Another really popular one. Mm, very popular. And then after that, you have Modern, which Modern is also constructed format, which the rest of these are where you're going in the tournament section are constructed, so I'll stop saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but it uses the Modern frame cards um, from 8th edition forward. So all of the cards that come out after that 8th edition forward when the game updated with their border look, that's what you can play in Modern. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's to like have the, <laughs> the pool of cards, right? Right, so that you're just not looking at 25,000. Mm -hmm. Let's so. chop it in half. Let's make it a little more realistic, a little more. But there's some people that want to play with all of the cards. Yes. And that's, you got two formats for that, right? Yeah. Two tournament formats. You have Legacy, which allows cards from all sets, and it's known as an internal format, but it has this curated ban list. Cards are too strong, we're going to ban them. You can't bring them, you can't put them in your deck. As opposed to Vintage, which is also an eternal format that uses all the cards, but this format exists because it wants you to be able to play all of your cards. Yeah. So it's going to have more of a, it's going to have a restricted list which says cards that are too strong, you can only have one of it in your deck. One of them. Because most formats say you can have four copies of a card in your deck, but Vintage is like, we know there's broken cards that exist that are too strong, but we know you also want to play with them. So the only things you'll really see banned in Vintage are things that, mechanics that don't work, like there used to be a gambling mechanic called Anti. Nobody likes that. It's not supported past the very first set, so that's banned. Or cards that have like physical requirements, so things that require you to throw okay. cards, stuff like that. But otherwise, you can play with them all. I think there's even a card where you got to rip it off and like throw it like confetti. Yeah, chaos yeah, confetti. confetti. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. It's banned, exactly. But otherwise, your Black Lotuses, your Time Warps, your Power Nine cards, which refers to cards the nine most powerful cards that came out in the original alpha set that were too strong. <laughs> and now they're worth so much money. Uh, yeah, back to our expensive thing. Oh. So these formats are gonna be a little more expensive, Whoa. but luckily some shops are starting to allow players to use proxies. Oh, thank blessed be. Right. I love right. a good proxy. Yes, and so the next Eternal format is called Popper, and what this does is it restricts the card pool by saying each card has a rarity from rare to mythic, uh, common to mythic. Yeah. And so what it'll say is like we only want to use commons in our in our format. Yeah. Everything else get out. So any card that's been printed at common, that's allowed in Popper. Yeah. Even if later it's been like upshifted to like an uncommon card, common meaning you're going to see the most of them. Mm -hmm. It's the, usually the weakest. So you're going to see the most of them in booster packs. They want to play with those cards and try to make decks as strong as possible. I feel like these the popper is a really great way of like if you're already in magic and you've already experienced a lot of these formats it's a great way to just freshen things up and like restrict yourself mm -hmm. and make yourself a little more creative and maybe push your knowledge to the limit absolutely absolutely i have so for commander which we'll talk about later i've actually tried making commander decks with only popper card with oh, only yeah. commons and it's really interesting to try to see how powerful can i make this like that was printed at common <laughs> what were they thinking okay yeah. cool give me oh, right. yeah. stuff like that is pushing it to the limit and the big upside of popper price it's the most common cards they're gonna be five cents you can build decks pretty cheap. Oh yeah, there's gonna be tens of thousands of these puppies. So many, so that's, that is a big benefit of mm -hmm. this format compared to Vintage. You're not gonna win on turn one as to, like Vintage, all right? Again, broken. Yeah, unless you broken got some stuff. crazy you got commons. Some, you got really lucky, yeah. crazy commons, but you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna still have some strong games and it's gonna be different. 
and fresh, like you said. Yes. And so the last one that we have here is called, uh, it's the only sanctioned multiplayer format, and it's called Two-Headed Giant. Oh yeah, this one's fun. Which this is cool. This mm -hmm. has flavor in it too, right? Oh yeah. And so what you do is a team, you're on a team with one other player, and you're competing against someone else. So two, two pairs are ver against each other, and you share a life total, and you take all of your phases and your actions at the same time. So teamwork. Teamwork. And so that's that's the tournament formats. These are the ones where you're, you're going to grind, you're going to improve. There might be rewards on the line. There might be stakes, stuff like that, prize pools. And but if you're just like, I just want to play the game with my friends. Mm. These are casual formats. Tell us about casual formats, Rob. Oh, casual formats. These are probably my favorite because yeah. I'm a casual that's guy. Right. Yeah. You know, I take it easy. Um, I don't mind the competition personally, but it. It gets stressful after a while, and I got enough stress in my <laughs> life personally. So these are the formats that are designed to accommodate, you know, people like me, larger numbers of players, you know, people who aren't as committed to just uh, keeping up with all of these formats. And a lot of the things with the more tournament-focused formats is that they update a lot, and they are constantly shifting what cards you can and cannot use, so you yep. always have to be That's a really good point. upkeep. Yep. Yeah. Because as a lot of, especially in these eternal formats, or like modern, where new cards are getting added all the time, you gotta do your research to succeed and know what the best decks are, oh, that deck just got banned out because it's important cards are gone, a lot of research. Casual. We've made decks, I have decks that we made five years ago that I've never updated, but we still play them. Just keep rolling keep with rolling. it, why change it? And mm -hmm. there's not a lot of multiplayer, there's one multiplayer format that's sanctioned, so to allow more than two players to work together as a team or a giant free-for-all, these formats have cropped up to accommodate that, mm. so they're not sanctioned, but they don't need to be. We can still have fun, Absolutely. right? Just take it easy. It's not a big deal. Let's have 12 people playing Magic together. <laughs> and Ooh, not all stressful. Yeah, not all formats uh, are officially sanctioned. You know, we've mm -hmm. mentioned that before. And however many of these variants are popular in tournament play, you know, they, then they get picked up. Like, uh, there's a couple we'll talk about yeah. that have tournaments and things associated with them, but. They're not as uh, widely adopted by Wizards or thought about, or Wizards doesn't update a ban list, uh, things like sure. that. It's, it's like community-driven. Community yes, yep. more community-driven, mm -hmm. more community-based. Um, and like I said, they don't all have support of Wizards. So first up is Casual Constructed. This is your, your peasant, which is commons and stuff commons like that, right? Commons and like a certain amount of uncommons. Right. So just each of these has like a specific rule set. If you think mm -hmm. it's interesting, sticks out to you, there's a community about around it that wants to tell you about it. Uh, Frontier, I've never heard of this one. I haven't one. heard this one either. I I read about it, but it's bl I'm blanking. You're blanking? blanking right. All right, we'll carry on yeah. there. We, I didn't say that. Uh, Singleton, <laughs> this is, uh, you can only have one, one card. card of that variant, mm -hmm. of that type of card in your deck, yep. so then your whole deck is made of unique individual cards. With the exception of lands, you can have any co co yes. copy, any number of copies of basic lands, because that's what allows you to play the game. Right. But otherwise, throw that four of rule out, we're having one copy each. Get it out of here. Mm -hmm. Tribal. Tribal Wars. This is, uh, you pick a tribe and you just smash them against each other. Exactly. I want to play elves. You want to play merfolk. Yes, please. Let's play some zombies, angels. Pick a tribe that speaks to you. Build a deck about it. Gladiator? Is this a uh, bunch of people enter the arena and only one left standing? It's free for all, probably. It sounds like it to mm -hmm. me. I should have I should have refreshed on these, but I do know what pre-modern is. Oh, lay it on me. Yeah, yeah. pre-modern is the time period from about nine cards from 1995 to 2003, and that's r right before Magic got its newest border. So the border that it had from the beginning of the game. Um, to 2003, it's taking that period of time and say, hey, let's make some decks out of that. Oh yeah, I have a lot of favorite cards from that oh, region yeah. in there. Oh yeah. Uh, it's about where I started too, it was early 2000s, but uh, next up, 
now that we're done with casual constructed, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, uh, all them. Next up is casual limited. So this is just like limited in tournament formats. It's taking all the 25,000 cards and just narrowing it down to really specific sets. So uh, that can be cube draft, which is somebody builds this uh, limited number of cards, just enough for everybody to uh, essentially get like booster packs, like yeah. booster packs. They're fake. They're made up, they right? It's like 15 cards. Resealable packs or Resealable like packs, yeah. And cubes are really cool because this, they'll say, I like this specific point in magic history. Yes. I like this set. I'm going to curate an environment around mm -hmm. it. 300 cards make these packs. And we're going to draft that and try to simulate what it was like playing them. Yeah, like I have a cube that I've been dying to play right now mm -hmm. that is all of the comedy, all of the silver border, all of the funny cards. They had uh, a mm -hmm. number of funny sets that are all silver mm -hmm. border to let you know that these aren't legitimate like for tournament Unglued, play. Unhinged. unhinged, unstable, unstable, and unsanctioned. Unsanctioned. The unsets. The unsets. And uh, that's fits right into this perfectly is that it's just got enough 300 cards enough for like six people to draft mm -hmm. out of and build your own decks and have a good time i can't believe we didn't mention unsets because they're so goofy it's there are some players that don't even play like serious magic because they just show up for the goofy sets mm -hmm. and they're like and these goofy sets will be things like you have to touch your hands together <laughs> at all times or a bad thing happens. Handcuffs, yeah. Or you have to balance this card on your head and if it falls off, something bad happens. Or If you, you don't scream, yeah. this card dies. <laughs> red hot hot. Red hot. Yeah. Uh, cheat this card into play, right? It's, yeah, it's a, legal to cheat this card. <laughs> if you're on more on the zany side of games, you play it for the, just like the humor of it, yeah. unsets would be there for you. Yeah. And of those, are not sanctioned. No, not sanctioned. <laughs> Completely casual. We've had a lot of great times with unsets. Uh, and then there's backdraft, which is where you build the worst deck you can <laughs> possibly make for someone else to play. Mm -hmm. And then you play a tournament with these horrible, horrible decks and see who uh, can rack up the most wins. And also, if their deck, what, loses? Yes. It, the, it scores some points yes, too. If so the deck it, they made loses, yes. they win. Yeah, I. This is the first time I've seen this. So I'm like, yes, so cool. please. So to make this function, yes, please. you will give them the cards that you require to be in the deck, like the land and all. The, not the land. Everything except the land. So then the player can make their own land base, yeah. which is their resource base to play, so that the deck actually works. But you're gonna give them all these bad cards that have no synergy, no interaction. It's hilarious. So if you somehow win with the bad deck that was given to you, you get a point. And if they lose with the deck you gave them, you get a point. It's so good. It's hilarious. What about this uh, next one? Reject rare draft. Is that we don't play with rares? Get them out of here. Get them out of here. It's just draft, but you just no rares. Catch the rares. Pitch okay. The rares. And, and then, type four. No, I forgot. <laughs> All right. Too easy, man. Then moving on to casual multiplayer. This is your free for all. Too easy. You get a number of folks around and mm -hmm. you battle it out. Assassin, which is you get a target. Yes. And you have to knock them out. Secretly assign roles mm -hmm. and, and secretly assign targets. And if you can knock them out, you, we, you get the win. It's like a social deduction yeah. game on top mm -hmm. of magic. Yeah. So you can win by defeating everyone, but you don't win unless you meet your objective too. Fun. Kill your target. So good. Mm -hmm. And then Emperor, which is... The way we've played it is a 3v3, where there's the Emperor in the middle. Yeah, is it two specifically knights. Commander, though? I don't think or it's specific. You can just play with any yeah, kind of deck, Yeah, if you too. have uh, like any kinds of decks, I think as long as you're playing the 3v3 format of mm -hmm. Emperor in the middle, two knights on the side say across from you and the goal of the game is to be the first team to defeat the other person's emperor right and knights can only attack knights yep. until you've defeated the knight across from you and, and emperors have full carte blanche mm -hmm. they can attack anybody yep. doesn't matter who so it's the as a knight you're trying to defeat the knight in front of you as quick yep. as possible so then you can start helping your emperor as an emperor you're trying to defeat the emperor but also keep your knights alive yes 
Really, really cool format. It's solid. We play it all the time. Oh yeah. And then next up is probably one of the most popular formats. It might be the most mind. popular at this point. Is Commander. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh boy, do I love me some Commander. Oh, yes. It's mm -hmm. just flavor, it's just goodness, it's just mm, singleton. Like It's mm -hmm. so many things mixed together. But essentially, uh, it's derived from a fan-created game called Elder Dragon Highlander, which is like all of those big cards that don't work in any of these tournament formats, mm -hmm. all of these cool cards that are just laying around. What yeah. if you threw them in a deck and all unique one singleton yeah. format, unique cards through the whole thing, there's 99 of them, and then you have one card that sits aside and it's always kind of technically in your hand mm -hmm. in you the always have zone. access to it right mm -hmm. always have access to it it sits to the side and you can play it as long as you have the mana to play it mm -hmm. it increases costs every time it's removed but it's sort of the identity of the deck it it, yes. le it gives you a uh, indication as to what you are trying to do or uh, uh, emphasize with your deck. Yeah, it's really, it's so the identity of the mm -hmm. deck's a good way to put it for yeah. multiple purposes because it's a legendary creature right. that you put in the command zone, what it's called, and it will have the c casting cost. Mm -hmm. So say it costs two red and a white. You can now only have red and white cards in your deck. Yeah, so. So that limits the pool of cards and limits the types of abilities that you can use. But also, since you always have access to that card, you can build your deck to take advantage of what it does. So flavorfully, you can only use these, the colors, and mechanically, you can build around a style that you want to emphasize. It's so cool, and it's just so mm, chef's kiss. It's right? super expressive, super flexible, and it, it, I think it's very supportive of like the Vorthos players that love the flavor. I am going to build a deck with only goats, and I've done it. It was bad. But all goats. You did it? Goat tribal. Goat tribal. Right? Okay. Or I'm going to build with this cr creature, this legendary creature, Urza. All right? I can only put cards that make sense for Urza to use. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, and I've, I've heard, I've listened to podcasts like, I don't use that card because the character, that makes no sense to the character's lore. Mm -hmm. But then there's also people on the other side, on the spiky side of the game where they're like, and this is, might be called CEDH, right? Mm -hmm. Where they want to, get this hundred, that's the thing we forgot, it's a hundred cards, which is bigger than most other formats, which yeah. is 60 cards. And so, but they want to try to make the decks as fast as possible, as and win as quick as possible. Well, it's 99 in the deck. Yeah, 99, and, and then, uh, yeah, cool. <laughs> I always I always say that, just a hundred by, ha by habit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's super flexible, and it's kept us playing for what, five, six years? Just mm -hmm. specifically this format? And at this point? Um, a big reason I am a fan of it is it's more like a board game in a lot of regards mm -hmm. where you're more standard and you're limited and constructed and stuff like that. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's like a knife fight. This is like a little slower pace. It can be. CEDH is like... They can go quick, yeah. Oh, over crazy. There. They mm -hmm. have a lot of low-costed stuff and yeah. they just go fast right out the gates and it's more competitive but mm. in commander it's slower pace it reminds me more of a board game it's multiplayer so mm -hmm. we usually play with four people and then there's also this element laid over top that's table talk yes that is I don't want to just say manipulation, but politics it's aligned and table politics. Talk. We did a whole yeah. episode on it, We right? did a whole episode on it. Communicating and talking to the other players to take, get advantage from them. Exactly. It's, it's awesome. It's a facet that's kept us in the game. Mm -hmm. And what's awesome is like new legendary creatures are always coming out. So mm -hmm. you're always like, oh, I should build that. I should build that deck. I should build that deck. Yes. Oh, I love that. Oh, give me that, right? And so it, it is always expanding and always it rewards creativity. It feeds mm -hmm. like every aspect of Magic the Gathering, but in a way that appeals to me mm -hmm. personally, where there's always new legendaries coming out to build decks around, but 
it's also like the ones I have will still work. I can update those and work within mm, those yes. and constraints As there. new cards come out, mm -hmm. maybe your deck gets better, yeah. right? Or maybe a card comes out that's like, this card that was in my deck doesn't flavorfully make sense, but this does now. Get out of here. Yep. So it appeals to the builders and the continuous building, mm -hmm. but also you don't really have to do that. You can just hang with what you have. There's exactly. tons of new products coming out from Magic the Gathering, which we're not endorsing, but I'm just Without, saying yeah. it's there. <laughs> you can buy commander decks straight from Magic, even mm -hmm. if it's not sanctioned or a tournament yeah. format in any way. And honestly, we could do a whole commander episode. So as we're hitting the top of the hour, we'll wrap it up. But what I will say is thinking back to bottom of the hour you're right yeah <laughs> we're at the bottom now we're not starting over no i think i did that last week too oh, that's fine it's fine it's last uh, week it's last week uh but at the bottom of the hour here as we're wrapping up i will say it, thinking about our psychographics uh, the timmy's love community mm. your big things the uh i was gonna say jimmy's <laughs> the johnny's really love commander because you can make intricate weird things work because you always have access to this card and the spikes love it because you can tinker and and squeeze you know mm -hmm. all of the power out of it so it is great for that oh yeah and combo players there's always a machine to make mm -hmm. and to crank and yes. to build and combos to look for for combo players and exactly it's all there it's got it all if you want us to do the commander episode let us know Yes, please. <laughs> I, I'm dying to do the Commander <laughs> episode. But we do have one format left, and that's inspired by Commander, actually. Oh. And I, I really, I like to put this one on here because I think if it, it might fit for players who are coming from 60-card formats, right? It's called Oathbreaker, and it's a fan-created Commander variation where you have 58 card decks and then two cards that you always have access to you have a planeswalker and their signature spell so coming from a 60 card format it might be a nice transition to like i like the smaller deck i like being able to see um see the things happen quicker because you have a smaller deck but also in the free-for-all form strategy and commander can take a long time it to play can. one game. We've had four hour game, three hour game. Yeah, we've had those. And it's like average, I'd say an hour to two, yep. if being realistic. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it just drags on. So Oathbreaker, I, I've heard some people really like that for the speed of the game as well. Right. So as we wrap up here, I think it's really important to just touch on that. Commander is great for community. There are over 40 million players worldwide, and it's just been like such a good bridge the to make. Magic is good for oh, community. Yes. Yeah. Commander. I'm stuck He's on Commander. Got Commander on the, the brain. brain. But yeah, okay, so there aren't 40 million <laughs> Mag Commander players, but there are 40 million Magic the Gathering players. You got it. Yeah. And it's been great for making connections. I don't know how many times I've been like, I've heard someone like reference just something about Magic, and I'm like, hold up. You know? You play magic? You play magic? Bro, you play magic. Oh, and I've made friends that I'm still friends with today just because I, I was buying magic product and they saw me. You want to play? Yeah, absolutely. So, and so just think about that. Like, it's really good for bridging the gap and making f new friends. And so to summarize the episode here, bottom of the hour, got bottom it. Bottom right. of the hour. We think it's really worth episodes that <laughs> summarize these episodes is that it's worth playing magic for ultimately self-expression if you're a player that likes mastering a game the nuts and bolts mm -hmm. and tinkering with it getting sh the most out of it it's there for you if you like the aesthetics mm -hmm. the flavor like injecting yourself into the philosophy of the game it's there for you if you're a creative person that wants to like just make thing new things, things work, niche things. It's got it. It's got it. and it's got community. Mm -hmm. So I hope after these two episodes, you've learned something about magic. You found. I hope they found some reason to want to try it. Yes, and join the forty million. Join the forty Let's million. Let's get, get it, it to, to a trillion. Fifty. Oh, a trillion. Oh. Get it to Let's seven get trillion. It to seven trillion. Yeah. Yeah. Let's Everyone's go. playing magic. <laughs> So as we wrap up, if you have any specific questions about magic, if there's any magic topics you want us to address, please send us some questions at shareddiscoveryshow at gmail.com. 
Ron, we forgot to write down the Twitter. We made it. We forgot to write it down. We forgot to write it down. Okay. Next time. Next time. It'll be in the show notes. We'll get you Look next for time. our Twitter there. And thanks immensely to BCTV for allowing us to continue putting this production on. You guys rock. Mm -hmm. So as we sign off, just want to thank you for joining us on episode 11 of Shared Discovery. As we go, please make sure to be kind, have fun, and, you know, just play some games. Let's try some magic. So, Ron, sign us off. Yo, riches must be divided, but real wealth can be shared. Ooh. Bye now. I love it. I love it. Thanks for joining us. Yeah.